we're transported back all the way to 539 BC. We've moved on about 24 years now since the death of Nebuchadnezzar. And we're in a time frame of, a, of zero to two years from the time when Cyrus will make his decree for the Jews to return to the land. And of course, we know from Daniel chapter one that he continued through until the first year of Cyrus the king. He's now been in Babylon for about 68 years, so long, 68 years, and has progressed to around 85 years of age. Well, in that time period, brothers and sisters, Daniel's now witnessed the coming and going of six Babylonian kings, from Nebuchadnezzar through to Belshazzar. Perhaps it's just a coincidence that six is the number of man. The Babylon has fallen, says Jeremiah in chapter 51. That city that Nebuchadnezzar described as great Babylon that I have built, that capitalized the empire, that's been taken. The living God of Israel has been vindicated. What is prophesied has come to pass. And who rules in the kingdoms of men? God does, point proven. But as we'll see, the kingdoms of men are to go on for quite a while yet. And while the kingdoms of men continue, so there will be a struggle that continues for men to accept that, that God and not men rules in the kingdom of men. But this chapter is, is somewhat biographical, not somewhat, it is biographical of Daniel. It deals with one of God's ensamples. And we learn, don't we, from these things to pursue in our lives or things perhaps to avoid. God, of course, is interested in the development of characters for his kingdom. And that's why he gives us examples like Daniel in chapter six to nine. And in fact, the chapter, it, it tells us that we need to pay attention to Daniel in this chapter. You might have noticed it uses the phrase, this Daniel. In fact, it comes up eight times. Now, three of those in chapter, uh, sorry, in verse 3, 5 and verse 28, it uses literally the this Daniel as a phrase, but the Chaldee and the Hebrew corresponding words used when preceding Daniel's name in verse 2, 10, 13, 24 and 26 should all be translated as this Daniel eight times. Well, why? Why say this Daniel? Is it because we might be confused with other Daniels? And why is he not referred to like this in any of the chapters up to chapter 6? Well, you see, the chapter's placing a particular emphasis on the individual here. The chapter is about observing the example of the man Daniel, to think about him, to consider him, to learn from him. And this is a chapter about Daniel, the man the servant of God. Try again. There we go. And of course, we learn a lot about the character. The chapter highlights the characteristics of Daniel. We see the consistency of Daniel's behavior, absolute consistency, and that's clearly recognized by his enemies and the king. We see that he's a man of prayer. He's in tune with his God. He's constantly working on his relationship with his God. And he's a man of understanding in the scriptures. He knows them. He applies them. And we'll see an application of this where he's taken the words of Solomon and he's applied that to his setting and routine of personal prayer. And of course, he's saved by faith. Both the New Testament and the Old Testament make that observation. He's a humble man. He didn't open his mouth, not once, when he's being accused and, and falsely. He patiently endured. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. And he, and he was motivated to do so, not so the world could marvel at him and his faith, and that he did, sorry, but that the purpose of God might be furthered 
That's what motivated Daniel, that the gospel might be preached and that all men should come to give glory unto the living God, whose kingdom will be established forever and whose dominion is the whole world. And these are just some of the highlights of things that we can learn from this Daniel, a man we're told three times was a man greatly beloved of his God. We also find, brothers and sisters, that there's a theme of conflict in Daniel chapter 6. The key thing is that of a conflict. Just as some of the other chapters preceding chapter 6 and the lessons that they brought contained a theme of conflict. Look at chapter 1. We've got the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. In chapter 3, it's the worship of the world versus the worship of God. Chapter 4 and 5, it's about the honour of the world versus the honour of God. And here in chapter 6, it's about the law of the world versus the law of God. And there's some key questions that are, are asked and answered that we'll go through tonight. Did the God of Daniel have the power over the law of men? You know, they looked to find occasion against Daniel based on his keeping of the law of his God rather than the law of men that they had set up. And so there's a challenge. Who would be vindicated? You know, the law of Moses, uh, sorry, the law of the Medes and the Persians was one that could not be changed, at least not by men, but could God, no, could God who, who changes the times and the seasons have power over this? And could he change the consequences? Could he deliver from a law that condemns to death where the hand of a man could not? Well, we come to the first section of our chapter tonight. I've got a section break up here of verses 1 to 3. I've just entitled that, This Daniel. It's our introduction to Daniel the man. And so Darius reigns, doesn't he, brothers and sisters? Babylon is conquered. And God was right. And Nebuchadnezzar's image, all of gold, was wrong. And so we find here there's... A vast empire, there's 120 princes, as it says there. The word means satraps or, or governors. And they're officiating the affairs of all the provinces in the kingdom. They're maintaining law and order. They're collecting taxes and, and making sure that the interests of the king at a province level were maintained. And in verse 2, over these 120 were three presidents. So there's a, there's a secondary filter of important information or intelligence that was reported up by those governors to the presidents. And the presidents were also auditors of the tribute that was collected from each of the provinces. The presidents were really identifiers of risk who put in place mitigation plans and, and, uh, and based on the reports, uh, they did that based on the reports of the security situation or the economic or the food situations in each of the provinces. And of course, they also protected the king's income stream and his savings. They looked after his bank account. Well, why did they do that? It tells us that the king should have no damage, which just means that he should suffer no loss. RSV and Rotherham's actually put it in that way. So that he should suffer no loss of his power base or his wealth. So to the king, the president was a pretty important position to hold and one that the king would have had to greatly trust. So there's three presidents and it says that Daniel was first. And literally it means of which Daniel was one. So all three presidents were of equal rank. And then we come to verse 3. And this is really where the trouble starts for Daniel. And it's quite likely, of course, that the other presidents were, were jealous of Daniel uh, well before they banded themselves together against him. I mean, Daniel, he's just a, one of the children of the captivity of Judah. And here he is holding an equal ranking to themselves. But they tolerated that. That is until we get to the end of the verse. And of course, we see the end of the verse here, that the king thought to set Daniel over the whole realm. Well, that makes things different, doesn't it? 
So the king is mulling this over in his mind, and clearly he's, he's speaking about it openly because they've become aware of that fact. And so now Daniel is going to be set in a higher ranking. He's only going to be second to the king, and he's going to have authority over the whole kingdom. Well, now, why? Why would the king want to do that? And the answer is in the verse. You see, where it says there, then this Daniel was preferred, the word preferred there means like a star to glitter from afar. So Daniel stood out in those political heavens. He was just like a twinkling star against the, the blackness of the dark night sky. And the king could see from miles away that this Daniel was just the kind of man that he wanted to be second in command. But, you know, Rotherham's gives us a, a little bit more richness in the translation. And he says that Daniel signalized himself above the ministers or, or the presidents and the satraps because, because a distinguished, of course, to distinguish is there's a separation that's been put there isn't it? That's what distinguished means. And so what was it that distinguished Daniel? Well, it was the spirit. It was the excellent spirit that was in him. This separate, separated him from the others that the king also greatly trusted, but he stood out from them. Now, Daniel certainly wasn't the type to be self-promoting. That was the fact that he, he was noticed. Well, it was because of other factors, not because he had tried to work his way up the ladder. You know, that excellent spirit, that was a characteristic, wasn't it? That, that when we look at Daniel, he was known for that amongst his peers of his own day. And as one of the great characters and notable characters of the Bible, this is an outstanding feature, isn't it, to us? And one that we can aspire to as well. You know, there's a, a little bit more richness that's given to us about Daniel and this standing out from the others. Have a look at uh, the, on the screen here, or Daniel 12, if you want to turn there, and verse 3. Because this fills out the picture a bit further about this Daniel. So it says, they that be wise, if you look in the margin in chapter 12, it says, teachers shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Well, wasn't that, that was Daniel, wasn't it? His example was a means to teach his people and us today, all the way in 2020, how we should behave ourselves in the pursuit of righteousness to the glory of our God. But it wasn't about fame. It wasn't about fortune. For Daniel, it was simply about attitude and consistency of conduct. Daniel didn't connive, didn't work his way up. He simply acted faithfully and consistently, and others took notice of that. Of course, God was working with him as well. But why? Why was it important that Daniel should find a place and be installed in, in a position of power like he was, not only in Darius's reign, but of course we saw that happened a long time before in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar as well. Why? Well, because the effect that he had on both was to make them, to bring them to a point where they confessed and they actually preached to all the people of the earth that the God of heaven, Daniel's God, was to be feared and obeyed as he rules in the kingdoms of men. He was influencing, brothers and sisters, the most powerful people to the effect of preaching the gospel into all parts of their empire. Why? To turn many to righteousness. It's not about his glory, is it? It was all about God's glory. But what he did, he did well. Well, verse 4 through to 9 Again, I've put a little a chapter break up there. I've just put it as the law of the Medes and Persians is brought into conflict with the law of Daniel's God. Well, verse 4. The presidents and the princes, they sought to find occasion against Daniel 
concerning the kingdom. They could find none occasion. You know what? They're driven by jealousy, these men, and they're just looking for any way possible to get rid of Daniel. But it was frustrating for these men. He's got no faults. They look for an occasion, which actually means a pretext, uh, to, to find something to accuse him of. What's a pretext? Well, a pretext is a story that's designed to make the listener to that story believe the intention is one thing when actually there's another intention completely behind it. So they, let's make a law, O king, because you are great and you are powerful and everyone should worship you. But really it's about, and we'll get rid of Daniel through this means as well. Well, just as the Pharisees uh, and the Sadducees had done, of course, you know, these were people who hated each other normally, but they found a common, a common enemy in the Lord and they came up with pretexts or false accusations, none of which, of course, could stick. And so in the end, they asked the question, are you the son of God? And based on his simple answer of absolute truthfulness, they accuse him of blasphemy and condemn him to death. So what do they do? Well, they start, of course, don't they? They're looking at Daniel's job and how well he's doing his job. And you know what they find? He's been faithful in everything. There's not a shred of evidence that they can find that would suggest otherwise. There's, there's no faults or errors. And when you think about that, brothers and sisters, what a practical example for us to look up to and aspire to, to follow it's also a good point of reflection, isn't it? Because if we had the same report card that came in for us, would it show the same as it did for Daniel? Well, verse 5, there's a meeting. It's hopeless. They can't find fault. They can't find error in his conduct at work. But what they did find through their observations of Daniel's conscientious work habits was that these were mirrored by his conscientious uh, worship of his God, his conscience towards the service of his God. He prays three times a day, a day to his God. And if they were to get rid of him, it would have to be something outside of his job. It would, it would really have to be something to do with his God or his religion because with regards to his God, Daniel will always act consistently. What a testimony to Daniel. And that's out of the mouth of his enemies. He will continue to act consistently, even though he knows he's walking into a trap that's been set up for him. And so here begins the challenge of the law of men being pitted against the law of God. Well, verse 6, it tells us that these presidents and princes... 122 of them, they assemble together to the king. And of course, the word assemble there, you can see in the margin, means tumultuously. It's the same word that's used in verse 11 and, and 15. And so it really sets a pattern of behavior here. That's what's shown. It conveys this sense of urgency, excitement, alarm. And the king, well, the king all of a sudden has these 122 appear before him and somewhat you'd have to think he's been destabilized that and, and he just gets carried along on the power of the tide that hits him completely out of the blue well verse 7 all all they say of the presidents of the kingdom the governors princes counselors captains all have consulted together to establish a royal uh, statute to make a firm decree and uh, that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of thee o king he shall be cast into the den of lions all they say all means the whole unsurprisingly perhaps but right from the start what we see is that the making of this law was based on a false premise a lie just as the law of sin and death came into this world because of a false premise, a lie. All would have to have meant that Daniel was involved, that Daniel had given his voice of support 
but clearly he wasn't involved. In fact, he only hears about it in verse 10, after the decree has been signed. And in verse 6, it says, Then these presidents and princes, which is putting a, a distinction there, to this Daniel. So Daniel wasn't part of this. All was a lie. But the king, with all this urgency, he didn't have time to test that claim. And though Daniel wasn't present with them, he, well, he just must have assumed that Daniel had been consulted. They said all. He believed that that must be the case. But they also speak of, of captains and counsellors and princes having been consulted and having been given, uh, or have given their approval as well. But they didn't come along. It's only the, the presidents and the uh, the 120 governors who come along. So not everybody's present. So Daniel not being there, maybe not totally unusual for the king. Now, the question is, is it, is it strange that you've got 122 of the, the king's most trusted servants suddenly arriving with a whole lot of urgency and purpose and put forward this idea that no other god or man should be worshipped, but only the king for the next 30 days? Is that a strange suggestion? Well, it's not overly unusual. You see, the Persians believed that the king was a representative of their God, of light and, and good. A God that was known as Ormazd, O-R-M-A-Z-D, or Z-D, depending on where you come from, Jason Bobus. He and the king was a God on earth. And his role, well, his role was to fight against the God of darkness and evil, a God known as Arimen to prevent the world being filled with evil. Okay, so on the slide there, you see there's a depiction of this God, Arimen, the God of darkness. And on the uh, picture on the right-hand side there, he's fighting against the other God, Ormuzd. So the God of darkness and evil is symbolised as a lion by the Persians. And these men, they've obviously, they've watched Daniel's consistent uh, behaviour and they've come up with an idea to get him with that consistent behaviour. He prays three times a day to his God. In 30 days, that's 90 prayers. Albeit, they only needed one, didn't they? They only needed to catch him doing one. That was enough to convict him of uh, to uh, sentence him to death. So the den of lions is a, a representative of this god of evil, Arimen. And D Daniel would be thrown into that den because he had opposed the god of light, King Darius, who was the embodiment of almost on the earth, apparently. And that was due to Daniel not obeying the law of the king. So he'd be thrown to the, the god uh, Arimen represented in that den of lions. And so the den of lions, well, what, what's the symbol of the lion in scripture? Well, certainly there's a, a lot of occasions where we find lions mentioned throughout scripture, but there's quite a few through the, the Psalms in particular. So that imagery of, of the lion, as it's represented to us in just even some of the Psalms I've got on the slide there, Daniel must have, he must have perceived that there was a connection between the wicked men who rose up against him and the lions that were waiting to finish off their evil work. And so just to, to illustrate what the lion symbolizes, in the Psalms on the screen there and many others, but I'll just deal just uh, with Psalm 7 there. It talks about the enemies of the saints, the wicked men, and it likens them to lions who seek to tear the righteous into pieces. But in verse 8 and verse 10, which would have given Daniel great hope, it tells us that God is the judge and he will determine who dies and who he saves. So going through, having a look at some of those other Psalms, you'll find the same thing. The lion is representative of the wicked, the wicked, the wicked, 
of sin as embodied in the enemies of the psalmist, as enemies of the Lord. An interesting symbol. Well, verse 8. Now, they say, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed, according to, as we know, the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. The decree, sign the decree, or establish the decree. The decree, the word means an interdict. It's a binding law. It's one that, once it is signed off, can't be changed. But Rotherham gives us a, a little bit more uh, flavour here as well. He says, Now, O king, wilt thou establish the interdict? But it depends on how you read it, isn't it? You could read it as, Now, O king, wilt thou establish the interdict? I mean, we've put it before you. What do you think? But it's not, because the sense of the word is not about a polite question, but it's a commandment. It's a statement that they're making here. Now, O king, wilt thou establish the interdict? Oh, okay, well, that's a bit different. They might have been lesser in rank than the king, but they were still the top 122 most important people in his kingdom, and they were very capable of raising a revolt to oust him from being king. And I think for this reason, and among others, which I'll just touch on very briefly, I don't believe that Darius was puffed up with pride and wrote the writing and signed it because he was overcome with his ego. I don't believe that's the case. But instead, I think what he's doing is he's responding with a natural instinct to a sharp command with a, a force of people in front of him. And he behaved in such a way in order to save himself, to preserve himself, at least temporarily. You see, unlike Daniel, at this point in time, though certainly he has an appreciation and, and some uh, level of belief in Daniel's God, he doesn't believe that Daniel's God alone has the power to save and to deliver from death. You see the contrast there? But what else about Darius? Look at his behaviour and his words through uh, the, the passages through 14 to 27. The verses, sorry. They, they don't portray a man who's affected by and lifted up in pride. What do we find about him? Well, we find a man who feels emotional towards his most trusted servant. He castigates himself severely because, because he's preserved his own soul, but condemned his righteous servant. He has sincerity, albeit he lacks faith in his words uh, to Daniel on the way into the den. Thy God, whom thou serve continually, he will save thee, he will deliver thee. He wanted to believe that, but he, he wasn't quite sure at that point. He passes the night denying himself of any pleasures. I mean, if he didn't care, if he was a man filled with pride, he would have gone and feasted, but he didn't. He lay awake, he worried sick about Daniel, and he runs to Daniel at the crack of dawn, and then mightily rejoices concerning Daniel's deliverance by the hand of his God. And topped off by all of that, he swiftly executes a law of Moses style of punishment on the wicked and declares his faith in the gospel and preaches that into all of the earth. I don't think it's a man filled with pride. Yes, perhaps there was an, an element of pride in his decision to write the writing, but I think there's a lot more about intimidation and self-preservation that's uh, imp uh, implied there. Well, verse 9, Daniel's death sentence is written up. It's signed into the law of men, and now the trap's set, and there's no undoing this law. For Daniel, his strength, his absolute pinnacle of strength was his continual service to his God. But now it was to prove his greatest weakness, humanly speaking, of course. Well, the next section of verses 10 through to 17. Will the wicked prosper? Who's going to win in this battle? Well, Daniel, in verse 10, he didn't make a big scene about it, did he? He knew of the writing. He didn't go and protest. He didn't come up with an unusual act of defiance. He just acted consistently, as he'd always done. He always served his God, and in anything where the law of his God was contravened by the law of man, he chose to honour his God. And so he continues to act consistently. Now, it says that he went to his house 
went into his chamber that he could kneel down and he could pray to his God. Well, the chamber means an upper chamber. It means it's not on the basement or on the ground floor where maybe he could hide away a little bit. He was up on the first floor where he could be seen from the street. But what Daniel's really done in Babylon is created a little piece of Israel. Don't turn back there, or you can if you like, but in Exodus 30, it talks about or describes for us the altar of incense it being a symbol of prayer. It talks about it having a top and sides. But when you're in Exodus 30, in the margin, it, it talks about top as being a roof and side as being walls. So it's architectural terms that are being used, as you would make a house with roof, with a roof and walls. But this is one that has an aspect that's pointed towards Jerusalem. Daniel had established a house of prayer here in the midst of Babylon. And he directed the place where, uh, directed it towards the place where God had chosen to set his name that will be the future capital of God's kingdom on the earth. So he's physically in Babylon, but really in his heart and his mind, he's in his, uh, back in Israel. Well, for us, there's a point of self-examination there too, isn't there? How, you know, how are our houses set up? What's being spoken about within the chambers of our mind? The physical setting for Daniel was reflective of the mental and the spiritual state of his mind. He set his heart and his mind and his face towards Jerusalem. But why did he pattern it in this way? Why pray towards Jerusalem like this? And really it comes back to inspiration, doesn't it, of those who have gone before in the scriptures. So Daniel understood the scriptures. And back in the first of Kings, chapter uh, 8, verse 33 to 34, and then 46 to 49, we find through that chapter there's Solomon at the dedication of the temple once it had been uh, completed, being built in Jerusalem. And in uh, the first of Kings, uh, verse 33 and 34, we'll just read through that. When thy people, Israel, be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven, hear those prayers, and forgive the sin of thy people, and bring them again, deliver, save them. God, unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. So when Israel's in captivity, pray to God for forgiveness and deliverance, is Solomon's uh, suggestion in the prayer. Well, I believe that Daniel prayed three times a day for those exact things. But how do we know that? Well, we go a little bit further. We won't read the uh, verses specifically, but verse 46 of Solomon's uh, prayer in, in 1 Kings 8. He talks there about the fact that all have sinned. And of course, Daniel in his own prayers, recorded in the book of Daniel, prays for his own sins and those of his people. He acknowledges the sins. Okay, verse 47 to 48, similar to the earlier uh, section of verses in 33 to 34, they're to pray to God when they're in captivity, they're to confess their sins. But there's more detail because Solomon in verse 48 says, but pray toward their land, towards their city and towards the house of their God, which was in Jerusalem. You see, Daniel understood the scriptures and he acted on this in a way that he established his house of prayer in Babylon. He did that facing towards the land, the city, and the house of God. He followed Solomon's advice. But what's more beautiful in some ways is at the end of verse 49, first of uh, Kings 8, it speaks there of the fact that God would maintain their cause. It means judgment. And of course, Daniel, the man who was placed in the court of kings, has a name that means God is judge. And in the events of Daniel 6, 
we'd have to ask the question there, who's going to be Daniel's advocate when he is judged by the law of men? Darius tried, we find out, but he failed. So who would maintain Daniel's cause? Who would maintain the cause of this innocent man? And Daniel knew from the prayer of Solomon who would uphold his cause. And so he goes to his window and he prays that God may maintain his cause. So it's no wonder that the chapter, I think, emphasizes this Daniel, because he was for Israel the very embodiment of the spirit and the intent of Solomon's prayer. Turn to God. Trust in God. He is the deliverer. And the result of this was that they should, in 1 Kings 8, receive compassion from their captors if they did this. And doesn't that present ever so clearly at the end of this chapter? Okay. Verse 11. What happens? They assemble together again. Yep. It's not a quiet assembly. It's that, it's that noise. It's that excitement. It's a tumult once again, the same pattern. So, well, I suppose you could ask the question, why not make a lot of noise? I mean, victory has now been gained, right? The trap is now shut, and guess what? Daniel, in verse 11, was found in it. Okay, so verse 12, without delay, it would seem, they reassemble to the king. And again, it's not a nice assembly per se, they reassemble to the king, and what do they do? They demand of him to confirm that he's written up that new law and that he's signed it and it's unalterable. And Darius confirms, yes, I've done that, and yes, it can't be altered. And so here comes the master stroke of their, their intelligence, isn't it? They've cleverly set this up, and so now it's time to strike. How sweet, they must have been thinking, is the taste of victory. You know, here it is, their law triumphing over the law of Daniel's God. Daniel now being sent off to a certain death. It doesn't get any better than that. The plan was perfect. Well, that Daniel, they say, you know, O king, the one who you want to make second in command only to yourself in all the kingdom, the one that you want to set in a place above all the rest of us, that Daniel, well, guess what? He doesn't regard you, O king, that's what they say. And you notice within there, there's a mention of his of the children of the captivity of Judah. So there's part of that would certainly be a, a racist kind of an undertone, you would imagine, in that accusation. But there's also a, an offering of opinions on the place that captives should have. Daniel, after all, was a captive. He should be under the control of those through whose veins Persian blood flowed not in a position where he commanded Persia's true citizens. And it shows here a lot about the root cause of the jealousy and the hatred that these men had for Daniel. Of course, it's completely untrue, and Darius knew that. He knew that to be the case. He could see straight through their accusation. He didn't believe for a moment that Daniel had no regard for him. I mean, look at how he, he sees Daniel. He's a star in verse 3, who distinguished himself by an excellent spirit. That's how the king perceived Daniel. And this, this is something, of course, uh, when you think about it, uh, a, a very interesting situation because you look at how he responds. I mean, if that was Nebuchadnezzar and he was told that, oh, these, these men aren't doing what you commanded, well, Chapter three shows us that the first thing he did was throw them into a den of, uh, sorry, into a, a fiery furnace. He would have whipped up into a rage. But Darius in this event is absolutely opposite. Look at how in verse 14, it says that he is sore displeased, not with Daniel, with himself. And that tells us exactly how the king perceived this. It For him was a penny drop moment. He could now see that they had, set up a very clever plan specifically to remove Daniel. This wasn't about them showing regard towards the king and, and having his best interest at heart. It was all about being self-serving and manipulative to get to their desired outcome. And so we come to verse 14. We saw there the king was sore displeased with himself. Sore displeased, it literally means to stink or stank. Stank. 
he thought of himself as a putrid stinker. And he realized that he'd been played by this tumultuous crowd who had just carried him away. He had acted for it to preserve himself, and as a result, now he's endangered the life of a man that he greatly respected and loved. Well, he didn't react against Daniel. It's himself that he was upset with. Well, now this story, of course, builds on a secondary layer, doesn't it? There's a story here within... Um, uh, this is a story, sorry, that's within a bigger picture. There's a struggle, and think of a Garden of Eden level struggle. It's the struggle of the kingdoms of men, the power of men, the seed of the serpent, versus the power of the living God. What now plays out is another episode to the question of who exactly rules in the kingdoms of men. The stage is set. What's the outcome? Well, for Darius, in verse 14, what did he do? He set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. He laboured till the going down of the sun to deliver him. You know, even when a mortal man, as powerful as the king, and with all the good intentions in the world, sets his heart on trying to save. You think in our days, you, know, you think of doctors, surgeons, nurses, emergency personnel, Psychiatrists, there's so many people who you could turn to and see they've got good intentions. But ultimately, there's a problem. There's a, a factor that gets in the way of their work, and that's called human weakness. You see, humans, they might be able to delay the inevitable outcome of the living know that they shall die. I mean, think of Darius in that situation. He sort of preserved himself um, by quickly writing up the decree and signing it. But there is only one being who's able to deliver from death, and that's the God of heaven. Well, how do we know that? Well, because in the verse it tells us that to the going down of the sun, Darius laboured to deliver Daniel. So there's a set amount of time and an exact time that he had to work with. But how long was he labouring? Not quite sure, but there's something that we can be sure about. This labour was in agony. He was in agony. And this was a man who endeavours to find a means of deliverance from the inevitable, the law that cannot be changed, and in the end has to accept that there is no other way but that of verse 16, that the God of heaven must deliver him because there's no man on earth who could. I wonder what happened while the king was labouring to try to deliver Daniel. What about the others? What do they do, you think? Pretty sure they're probably throwing a few remarks or maybe some insults towards Daniel, just like they threw at the Lord as he hung upon that cross until the point that he yielded up his breath. And clearly, though, for Daniel, to watch Darius labouring as he did to deliver him, even to the going down of the sun, this had to be for Daniel a sign of that compassion that Solomon had spoken about in his prayer. He was trying to do just as Solomon's prayer had petitioned. And for Daniel, perhaps this was the first signs to him that there was a deliverance that the Lord would accomplish. Verse 15, the king gets a hurry up, doesn't he? Then these men assembled, again, that's that tumultuous assembly unto the king, and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed, like the king needed to be reminded of that. But of course, they're pressing home, aren't they? They're pressing home their advantage here. Well, these men, as the representatives of the spirit of the kingdoms of men, now want to press home their power. They want to prove that they're in control within the kingdoms of men. And to get Daniel into the lion's den and have him destroyed, well, then all the world would see that they had gained victory over Daniel's God. Their law was more powerful than God's law. And there's a very, very tiny amount of truth in that, in the sense that the law of Moses could not save, it could condemn a man to death with the breaking of it. But Daniel hadn't broken the law of God. That was a mistake on their part. He was innocent before his God. And this was to be a powerful illustration to Daniel to those of his peers of his time and to us today 
that the means by which God is going to deliver and bring salvation is not through a law, but it's through faith. Think of the words of John, 1 John 5 and verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And we're about to see that confirmed in this very chapter. And so then the king commanded. You see in verse 16, the king commanded. You can feel the reluctance in those words, can't you, brothers and sisters? The king was no God. He's just a man, he's subject to the same laws that we all are. Sin brings death, and he's powerless to stop it. And so he, on behalf of the kingdoms of men, spoke to execute the judgment on this Daniel, the servant of the living God. You know, when you think about that den and the description of it, and especially when we look at the next verse, verse 17, it must have been like a cave with a, perhaps a small entrance. So maybe a cave dug down with a pit inside of it, a small entrance, because they had to be able to bring a stone and place it over the mouth of that entrance and seal it. And so you can imagine, can't you, as Daniel is taken in through that entrance and he's thrown down. I don't think he was let down gently. He was thrown down into the pit that the, the king breaks out in emotion. And as he's being pulled back, from that entrance, he shouts out these words to Daniel of hope, of encouragement to his loved servant. He says, now the king spake. And here we find an admission on behalf of the king. It's an acknowledgement that only God can save man from death. Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And from these words at the end of the chapter, uh, sorry, the words at the end of the chapter, he certainly did appreciate that it wasn't just the immediate death now, but there's a greater meaning to it of deliverance from an everlasting death. And whether Daniel lived or, or died that day, God would raise him to life to be part of God's everlasting dominion. Of that, the king, it seemed to be hopeful. And there's a lot of sincerity in his words, but not quite yet a lot of faith, as verse 18 through 20 will show us. So it's another testimony to the consistency of Daniel. When Daniel's preparing for and actually being put down into that den of lions, as the Lord had the scriptures in his mind, then he must have also, I believe, had scriptures in his mind. Scriptures like Psalm 34, verse 4. Seek the Lord, trust in him. He is able to deliver us from our fears. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth them. Daniel had demonstrated through his life his fear of his God. Verse 8 to 9, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. It's not theoretical, is it? This is, this is illustrative. It's, it's experiential. Daniel's experienced it right at that point in time. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And, and if there's any time that you would have wanted to trust in God, this was that point in time. Well, verse 10, those that fear the Lord will not lack, says the psalmist. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. Well, that's good news if you're in Daniel's position. But they that seek the Lord shall not want or be lacking of any good of any of the goodness of God. In verse 19 to 20, the righteous, he says, will suffer affliction, but the Lord will deliver them from them all. God keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Now those, those would be, if Daniel was thinking of those words or similar from the scriptures, they would have been words of encouragement to Daniel, words that we can all learn from in our own lives. For Daniel to know that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous would have been comforting and sustaining for him. And of course, verse 17, the stone is brought. It's laid on the mouth of the, uh, of the den and it's sealed with the signet of the king and of the lords. Well, our Lord was also brought and laid in a tomb. 
and a great stone covered the mouth of it. And a signet was used to seal the tomb. So it's clear to see, isn't it, the type of our Lord as seen here in the experiences of Daniel. Of course, you can go to Matthew 27 and, and other places in the, uh, the Gospels for more of those parallels and those similarities. But, you know, the, the slight difference is, of course, that the line that Jesus, or the line that Jesus faced was the law of sin and death. Yes, Daniel was facing the same here, but the outcome was slightly different in that the Lord yielded up his breath. But though that be the case, he was, and because that is the case, sorry, he was in the lion's mouth, but would he be consumed? No, he would not. And three days later, he was raised from the grave and he was delivered from the mouth, from being inside of the mouth of the lion. Well, hope comes in the morning and verses 18 through 23 certainly show us that. In verse 18, it talks how the king passed the night fasting. And the word actually means to hunger, to twist. It comes from a root word that means to spin. And so what it's really telling us is that his stomach was tied up in knots with anxiety. And you'd imagine there's a fair bit of self-examination, some very severe self-examination that went on that night, a la verse 14. You know, Darius that night went to the house of mourning and not the house of feasting. You know, when it talks there about musicians coming in or music being brought before him. Look in the margin there. It says a table. A table. This is a, a feasting table. None of that that night. What about sleeping? Well, none of that that night. It fled from him, we're told. It, it, I think the verse here says it went away from him. His sleep went from him. But literally it means it fled from him. And even if he wanted to sleep, his mind could not have been still to allow that. He must have been thinking, you know, is Daniel's God able to save? Is Daniel alive? Is his God able to save? Is he alive? And you can imagine he's stirred up. Verse 19, so much so, no sleep. The crack of dawn, very early it says. That means literally dawn, the crack of the new day. He gets up and he and goes with haste to the den of lions. Well, the word haste there doesn't just literally mean what will simply mean he, he hurried there, he got, he got uh, you know, a bit of speed up and, and got there. It actually means terrify, tremble inwardly to palpitate. And so you can picture the king with his heart beating out of his chest, with agitation, with hope, with alarm. And he's running like Elijah before the, the chariot of Ahab, just a complete melting pot of emotion. And then we come to verse 20. He comes comes to the den and with a lamentable voice calls out to Daniel. Now I stopped and I looked at the length of that verse. What he said to Daniel, it's quite a long run-on kind of a sentence really. I mean, if you got to the den, when I thought about it, I'd probably call out, are you alive? Are you there? But not the king. You see, the king, with a fairly long-winded sentence, uh, essentially asks, who has won? Who, who's won? Is it the law of Daniel's God or the law of men? Did Daniel's God have power over men's laws? Could he change the consequences of men's laws? And the king's heart, it's beating on his sleeve, isn't it? Lamentable, a lamentable voice, afflicted. And this is obvious to everyone who was there with him. You know, he's, he's genuinely moved with compassion towards Daniel. There's no pretense, no pride to be salvaged here and notice how the king highlights to daniel and his most notable characteristic again continually serve his continual service of god the characteristic that the king himself admired because he saw because of that continual faithfulness towards his god that translated into a faithfulness towards him as king also so the question is asked can god do what darius could not can he save a man from death did he have the power over the, of the most powerful law of sin and death and its consequences? In verse 21, God is vindicated. He has the power. He's changed the laws of men. He's proved again that he rules in the kingdoms of men and his purpose will be accomplished. But Daniel's excellent spirit shines through. I mean, here's a man calling out to him 
And though Daniel probably understood that he's been coerced somewhat into making that law in the first place, he still lifted up his voice and commanded that it should happen. He wrote the writing and he signed the decree. He put Daniel's life into mortal danger. But despite all of that, Daniel's disposition, unchanged. His consistency, unwavering. It's incredible, isn't it? Do you know what's also incredible? This is actually the first time in the chapter that Daniel's actually uttered his voice. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. We see here a type of our Lord. Once again, in the life of Daniel. Well, verse 22 we see there that, uh, that Daniel responds. And again, it's thoughts from Psalm 34 that ring true. God heard Daniel's prayer. God sent his angel to strengthen him. God delivered. The lions went hungry. And when he came forth from the den, no bones broken. Not a single mark upon him, says verse 23. Well, it's a pattern, isn't it? God sends an angel and delivers Daniel's friends from the fiery furnace. He sends an angel, and he delivers Daniel. And I wonder just how long the angel stayed with Daniel that night. Daniel, of course, doesn't claim to be perfect. He, he says he's innocent before God and before the king. But he's not claiming that he's perfect. He's confessed his sins. We've seen, we've talked about that uh, before. But before the king, he'd only ever acted consistently. He'd performed his duty. And he prevented any hurt coming to the king. He hadn't been negligent. And even in this matter of this hastily processed law, his actions had not been in any way intended to disrespect the king. But those, ver those words in verse 23, no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in God. And as we mentioned in our opening comments, Daniel is saved because of faith. This is consistent in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, verse 33. By faith, he stopped the mouth of lions. And here, Daniel 6, verse 23, he was saved because he believed in his God. What a wonderful example. And look at the reaction of Darius. Just utter joy, sheer joy. He hoped all night that Daniel's God, the living God, was able to do what he himself could not. There's no pride in his response. He's just, he's just now clearly full of sincerity and faith. And Daniel's example, brothers and sisters, has converted Darius to a believer of the gospel, which we see because Darius then goes on to preach that gospel. But just before we get to there, and just as we bring our comments very much to a close here, verse 24. Verse 24, we see that the king commanded, and they brought those men, which had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces wherever they came at the bottom of the den, which gives us the idea, actually, that they just caught them out of the air. Those lions rose up to meet those bodies as they fell. Well, under the law of Moses, where there was a false accusation, the false accuser would be subjected to the same punishment that they wanted to meet out on the one they were accusing if they were found to be a false accuser. And though not under the law of Moses, the king's response was to apply the same outcome as that which was found in the law of Moses on these jealous and envious men. He's obeying the law of God already. But, but why the wives and the children? Well, usually it would be because they were all in it together with the husband or the father. Therefore, they were all guilty. Not true in all cases. The sons of Korah stood apart from Korah. Of course, they were saved while Korah was condemned to death. But what's going on here is, is a, a symbol. We're being told here that when God crushes the kingdoms of men, which he will, then all those who support the basis and the doctrines of the kingdom of men will also be crushed. That's exactly what the words break all their bones means. You know, it literally means to crush or crumble 
to beat in pieces and make dust. So in this event, God's vindicated again. And it's, it's a little cameo in the life of an individual here that shows a greater application that God's prophecy regarding the kingdoms of men versus the kingdom of God would be accomplished and God's kingdom will be established forever. And in case, in case we were doubtful of that, well, we find Darius tells us, no, that is the case. And he now believes, he now believes with all his heart in the gospel, the kingdom of God upon the earth. It's interesting, we, we won't go there now. I thought we might go to 2 Timothy 4, and you're, you're welcome to read it here as it's on the screen. But ultimately, what we find here is a very similar context. And Paul finds himself comparing himself to Daniel's experience here in the lion's den, and so much so that he quotes about it. So Paul, and it's exactly the same uh, context, really. And for the same purpose, Paul picks up and quotes those words. So Paul had faced many trials. He'd been, he'd been left and, and forsaken by his companions. There was no one left to maintain his cause. Hearken back to Solomon's words. But the Lord stood by him and strengthened him. And why? That by my preaching, uh, sorry, that by me, the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And look at what Darius now does. In verse 26, really the key lesson, the key personal lesson of Daniel in the lion's den is picked up. And in fact, in the first of Peter and 2, verse 12, Peter says, having your conversation, your behaviour, now think of Daniel here, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And this is the day of visitation for Darius. And he glorifies God and he preaches to his whole kingdom. It literally means into all the world that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. Oh, how beautiful is that? From the mouth of a Gentile convert, telling the world that the God of Israel rules in the kingdoms of men, though he was king over one of them. And God rules, he does in the kingdoms of men. God delivers those, verse 27, who are his, from those who would have power over and, uh, and oppress them within those kingdoms of men. Darius had tried his best. He tried to deliver Daniel, but he couldn't. Then he'd hoped that Daniel's God could, if he was the living God. And so before his very eyes, he saw this hope realized. And in this, he was converted. Effectively, he'd seen a resurrected man. And this new decree that he makes here, at the heart of it, it's really a confession of his faith, isn't it? It's a confession of Darius's faith. He believes the gospel message, the good news of the kingdom of God. And in fact, he's witnessed with his own eyes, as I've just said, that a type of the one through whom his and Daniel's and all of our salvation will be accomplished. Daniel came forth, didn't he, from the pit, from the tomb, from the grave, alive. And he's a type of our resurrected Lord, being innocent before God and men being saved by faith. And so think back to those words in chapter 12, the truth prospered. And this wise star had done his part in teaching through the demonstration of his faith. And the purpose of God was preached into all the world to bring many unto righteousness. Daniel, he hadn't sought any personal glory in all of this. He just consistently and he faithfully witnessed to the glory of his God. God truly rules in the kingdoms of men. Sure, there's figureheads that he sets up from among the basest of men, but they're just instruments in his hand. They're put in place to further his purpose, which is inexorably coming 
towards its conclusion. And so Daniel, verse 28, continues on, continuing on, just as consistently as ever. And he prospers. The, the word means he advances, he's promoted. He received the promotion of verse 3, after all. And he prospered because of this in the reign of Darius and Cyrus the Persian. The most beautiful thing, I think, is that he's promised by God that he'll stand in his lot at the end of days. His feet will stand in the land of Israel again. He'll stand in his lot at the end of days. And he'll continue to prosper when the kingdom of God is established on this earth. We pray, God, that all of us may stand with him in the presence of our kingdom.